Well, good afternoon to our viewers on the East Coast and good morning to our West Coast viewers. Thank you all for joining our second installment of the Reimagining Talent Acquisition webinar series brought to you by People Science. These monthly webinars focus on the different changes and challenges the business and the talent acquisition world are currently facing. So we encourage you to follow us and sign up for each monthly meeting. So to get started today, I'd like to introduce our panel. Presenting today's webinar is Christine Nicholas, founder and CEO of People Science. Developing People Science as a solution to one of the toughest hiring challenges, Christine's committed to driving dramatic business results. Operating in the US and abroad, Christine stays at the forefront of the changing talent landscape and is known as a well-regarded thought leader and speaker in the RPO space. We also have some very special guests with us this month. Mary Ann Spatola, founder and CEO of C3 Talent Strategies and author of the book, The Office is Dead Now What? A Post-Pandemic <laughs> Field Guide for Leadership. In Mary Ann's book, she really walks through how the pandemic actually put the spotlight on and amplified faulty leadership practices that we've been enduring in the workplace for years and came to show us new ways to lead, to both treat people as human beings and achieve the organizational results we seek. Happy to have you here, Marianne. Thank you. Our second guest is Farah Bostic. Farah is the founder and chief strategist of the Difference Engine. Farah created the Difference Engine based on her belief that deep understanding of customer needs is essential to growing businesses through great products and services. Farah has honed her analytical skills through her customer-centric insights as an advisor to some of the world's most respected brands, such as Apple, Microsoft, Disney, Samsung, and UPS. So welcome both of you. We're very happy to have you here and really looking forward to hearing your insights. And before I hand it over to Christine, I'd like to let our attendees know to send in your questions and comments in the Zoom QA chat throughout today's call. I'll keep an eye on those and make sure you get a response back. So with that, Christine, I'll hand it over to you. Thanks so much, Jess. Always keeping us on target, too. So <laughs> hello, everybody. Uh, yeah, even though we've retitled ourselves Reimagine, I want to say big appreciation always to our followers who've been with us since 2019. Um, it's good to see a lot of people on the call today. Really hot topic. Um, mm -hmm. We've got Marion who wrote the book on The Office <laughs> is Dead. Uh, Farrah just blows me away with her ability to look at, and if you're following us, you know, analytics and the truth behind numbers is always a very important um, point that we try to drive home, especially amongst the noise that we hear these days as far as employment is concerned. Uh, so just for the benefit of, of those of you who are new, I'll start off by going over some stats that we hear uh, about employment right now, cover some of those points, and then we'll get right into the meat of our discussion. Also, as Jess had mentioned, we know that these topics that we bring up are hot topics, and there's a lot of emotion behind them. Use it. Use it here. Tell us what you think. We really do want to know. And I think that the way that we'll get through this talent crisis that we have, and, and maybe even some of the political crisis we have, is by keeping conversations going. Even if we don't all agree, let's get our thoughts and voices out there. So feel free to put your questions and your comments in there. Jess will read them. If you want to be anonymous, you just want to sound something out and not have us share it, that's okay, too. We still are interested in what you have to say. Okay, so let's get right to it. The JOLTS report for last month showed that we added 8.8 .8 million jobs. Woohoo, still adding jobs. Now, at the height of the pandemic, we were adding 12 million jobs, like right after the pandemic, 12 million jobs. I think what's important to know about the JOLTS report is that it's going on a gradual decline, right? Mm -hmm. So going into the pandemic in 2019, we had 7,053,000 jobs open in July of 2019. And then fast forward to July of this year, we're at 8.18, which is a considerable job, be, drop because we have been at 10 million. But when I say continue, you know, consider it, let's look at it this way. So if this is the 12 million, if we came down to the 10, a little bit further down to the nine, now we're at the eight. We're not expecting to see this plummet if we look back at, at 2019. And this is not an indicator of how well the talent gap is going. This is an indicator of how many people are working, returning to the workforce. We still have a mass gap between the type of talent available and the type of talent that we need. And as these factors, you know, AI, work from home, as all these critical factors that we're gonna talk about in employment come into play, we just see that getting wider and wider. 
Um, <clears throat> unemployment rose to 3.8%, still historically low. I mean, that's really low. I think it's interesting, right, Marianne, shake your head. We're getting used yep. to these numbers being so low, but I remember 5.6 and you're like, that's really low. It is very difficult to recruit at 6%. At 3.8, you've got to get really, really good at what you do. Again, a good indicator of what's going on. Um, but again, that that the declines and the up and downs are minimal. I'd just like to, to add something else, too. You know, I think our whole economy, and I'd love to hear from the panel in a bit about this, our whole economy, we are used to up, down. We're, we're used yeah. to bear, bus, bear, bus, right? And isn't it better to live in a trajectory that's slowly growing? Right. And I think that media doesn't get that right. And media is there for the astounding story. And I think we're all getting used to what is media, what's real information, what's what's documented, where is this information coming from? So it's important to keep that in mind. OK, so with that, um, I'll also um, just note that the overtime requirements, according to the government, will be changing. Supposedly, there's some initiatives out there. We'll review those again next month. I don't I, I'm seeing a lot of headlines. These things take time. Um, to give you an idea, the Obama administration had an initiative out there that was based, you know, once it was implemented, almost implemented, the following administration, the Trump administration changed it. Now we've got another one going for it. So before we pull the trigger on these things, look at that. However, I would pay close attention to the temp laws in your state because they actually have changed considerably. If you're using con a contingent workforce and you aren't familiar with the state of Illinois and you aren't familiar with what's going on in New Jersey, soon to be New York, and I'm pretty sure California, you're going to be behind the ball. So better to be prepared than not. Uh, take a look at those. And again, we'll bring more specifics up about that at the next um, webinar in October. So I want to start the conversation by talking about some of the stats that we got from Forbes. Uh, so Forbes did, uh, I think, a pretty good recap on where 2023 is with remote work, right? And they pulled information from Upwork and a lot of other sources. Right now, I found their articles to be a little bit more, dare I say, legit than some of the other things that Fair I'll talk about that we see kind of floating out there just for headlines. Uh, so the most recent stats are saying that 12.7% of the workforce is remote. Now to give you an idea, going into the pandemic, that number was 9%. And this is not including hybrid, these are fully remote. It's a pretty significant number, right? 28.2% are hybrid. So we've got 20 or 12% fully remote, 28% a hybrid, meaning 40.9% of workers are working a hybrid or remote. This is not an insignificant number, right? <laughs> and shout out right now too, and you'll hear me talk about this a little bit later, the, de the desk lips employee. So the employee who is not behind a desk does not have this luxury and they are feeling left behind. We don't want to discount those. We'll talk about them a little bit, uh, a little bit later. By the way, has, has anybody on the panel heard of the desk list employee, like heard it framed that way before? Because... That's a new term that I learned from Edelman this week. And I thought it was really a good way to describe what we used to term first responders who had to work during the pandemic, right? So right. Who, was, who was in desk bound. And I hate to say, um, or, or they'll say, you know, intellect workers, we're all intellect workers, right? So I, I, I like the idea of using that term deskless workers. So what are the effects? And, and just one more statistic before we launch into this. Upwork is, is making a prediction that there will be 32 million, 32.6 million people by 2025 working remote. Well, it's not hybrid, that's remote. So I want to put this out to the panel and um, get an idea. I think Marianne's book is a good recap. I'm going to push your book because it's a great source for everybody. And I think Farah's ideas um, about these statistics and where things are going are also important. So I'm going to start with Marianne. When I say, okay, that's a pretty significant title. The office is dead. Tell us yep. what, you know, what's your intent with that title? You know, it's interesting. Um, I went through a book writing process that took about a year. And in July of 22, I had to land on my title. And a lot of people were speculative. I had people challenge me. It was a feedback process, just like you invited at the beginning of our webinar here, um, who said to me, but don't you think we'll all be back in the office by then? By the time your book publishes in January, we'll all be back in the office. And I'm like, mm, 
not so quick <laughs> if it happens at all, and it won't happen in the same way. And you know, I think it's paid off. Look where we are now. The the return to office. Um, war is still waging. There's still a big chasm between new workforce expectations and what executives and CEOs are demanding. Um, and really, the the essence of it is the workplace that we knew, the office we once knew, is dead. It will never be the same as it was before. And even when we do come back, it's not to say people won't be in the office, but the office will be very different than what it was in the past. Um, I just read a, a Gensler report, one of the biggest uh, real estate firms, um, and they added a new insight to this return to office piece where we've heard executives asking people to come back because of things like collaboration, social interaction, you know, onboarding and things like that, which are all very valid. But one of the things that got added to the list was 63% of respondents are looking for different types of workspace. So although they want to come back into the office, um, and Lego is a great example of this, organizations who have repurposed their office to be much more like a we work space, there's huddle rooms, there's private phone booth rooms, there's big open spaces to gather socially. What organizations like Lego have done is created a work environment that is more reflective of the way people work today and is actually inviting. Um, Lego's strategy was not to mandate it, but rather say to people, we've created spaces that help you do your best work. And we'd love to see you a couple of times a week. Come be with your peers and your colleagues and check in and see how people are doing. And it's working beautifully. So they've not mandated it but rather created an inviting space that helps people do their best work. And that's the difference and what I was trying to get after with my book and also to understand what are the leadership practices that enable people to do their best work. Um, and it was a really interesting process. I interviewed about 28 leaders globally, all different levels, different geographies, different industries. By the time I got a third of the way through the interview, the same five practices kept emerging. It almost became predictable um, as I went through the interview process, but things that we need to do differently in this new world of work. So two questions. Yeah. How, how did Lego do this? Like, how did Lego, did you see the office? Do you have any idea what they did? I mean, it's a- Yeah, it was, um, I did not talk to them directly. It was a secondary type interview, but I researched them. Um, and followed some of the articles and publications about what they were doing with their office space. Um, and what I was describing is their headquarters in Denmark, where they have about 2,000 employees. Um, but they got lots of credit and kudos for doing it right. What I think is interesting and ironic about where we are with these return to office strategies is, in some ways, although the pandemic has waned, we are right back where we were because nobody knows how to do that hybrid thing, right? Think about half our population is gonna be working in some form of a hybrid environment and organizations are struggling to figure out how do we do that? What is the best way? Because there's lots of ways to create a hybrid environment and there's no one right way to do it. There's not the proverbial playbook, right? It's the same struggle we had with COVID when it hit. There was no playbook, nobody knew how to do it. So here we are three years later with similar struggles and trying to figure out what is the right solution for our workplace to, to invite people back into a place they actually want to go um, and have them do their best work. Well, and I, you know, when I think of that, I think of having worked in the Valley for quite a few years, so many of the tech companies and then so many other companies copying, you know, Google started with the slide in the office yes. originally, right? To entice that particular demographic that they were going after. Yeah. But I, I remember being on streets of Philadelphia and walking past um, PNC and thinking, what the heck is this? And it was, a, it was childcare. Oh so, yeah. Yeah. Back in the day. It was sure. like kids behind glass in my opinion, because it was like, you, you could see them on the street, which is a little creepy. And, you know, a little concern <laughs> for the kid. But I also, you, we also were partnered with a division of J&J &J called Janssen Pharmaceutical. And when they opened, they were in a very remote part of, of New Jersey, I which had a very that. low population. And the, they were, the demographic that they were targeting had a big family population. They built into the organization a childcare center 
that was so enticing, right? And yeah. it's interesting. I don't know, and Farah or, or Jeff, if you've heard about um, looking at opening child care facilities or sponsoring those close to work. I have not heard anything new down there, but I think that's one of the factors that could certainly be considered since it's the parents that have been the most, many of them have been so affected by COVID. And the perks for them is I can be around for my kids more. What about bringing your kids to work? Anybody have an experience or hear of that growing anywhere? I haven't been hearing about it growing. I've been hearing the demand for it growing. The yeah. the, the real like barrier for, for many, particularly women who are still doing the primary caregiving roles, yes. both for children and for um, elderly parents is... Um, is like that's been one of the the return to work problems for women who had stepped out of the workforce in the pandemic to provide that um, to provide that child care. So the the desire for affordable child first of all affordable child care of any kind um, <laughs> would be nice. <laughs> but but I think you do have some women who are you know maybe have a bit more of a choice about whether to return to work or stay you know stay in a caregiver role. Um, where they're kind of feeling like, well, I could, you know, take my kids, you know, 20 miles this way and drop them off at, at daycare and then head another 10 miles back this direction to go to work. But that that is now depriving me of a thing that I did enjoy about the time where we were working from home remotely, which is I got to see my kids all day. And and now I don't get to see my kids all day. So there's like interesting kind of nuances to it now. It's not just about I can't afford the child care for the kind of higher end worker. It's also this is not the parenting style or lifestyle that I want to have. Um, so I'm hearing right. a lot more nuance about it. It's still a lot of demand for it. Not as much um, innovation around it, though. Yeah. And there are organizations who are getting creative in child care solutions. So, for example, Bloomberg offers a service and a reimbursement for emergency nanny care. Right. So if you have those, you know, you have that standard situation works in most days, but then all of a sudden you can't take them to a daycare because they're closed for whatever reason. You, you have a service they can provide. You can get a, you know, somebody who's been verified and qualified and get them like on the spot and they will come service you for uh, emergency take care needs. Well, and I've got to tell you, I've been really trying to sit on the other side of this, right? If we look at it, this is this is what the employee is saying they want. This is the kind of work environment they want. And, and this is what the employer is saying. I'm trying to defend the employer because I spend a lot of time like I, I have the luxury, so, so to speak, of spending more time with the C-suite and, and people in positions where they really do want to know what to do. And Farah, in our conversation the other day, I thought it was really, it was like this. Yeah, I really think the intent is there to get it right. But even if we just went back to that one topic of childcare, I don't know that it's being considered. Like the polls and, and the, the surveys that I see are out are, if you came back, do you want a, a de your own desk? Do you want a, a shared desk situation, mm -hmm. a no desk situation? But it's not really talking about quality of life. But when I listen to what I'm hearing through social media and what I'm hearing from employees, it's, I want you to understand me holistically, right? right. And I think the challenge is neither of these parties get this. Like, I don't think you say to an employer, to an employee, do you want to be heard holistically? And they're like, I've been saying I want to be held hope. No, <laughs> they're more like, I don't want to get in the car and drive every day. Why am I doing that? This doesn't make any sense. And on the, on the flip side, I'm hearing, I cannot come up with a good enough reason to say stay remote when I feel uncomfortable because I can't see what you're doing. Mm -hmm. yeah. So that brings so up there's like two different. Yeah, we have a comment from one of the viewers, Christine. So she said she believes that a general resistance by leaders to let go of old work habits, this is mainly why I return to offices here. So about how we work, tracking production, results, lack of trust, to name a few, is the primary mm -hmm. challenge in building an effective hybrid environment. It doesn't need to be that complicated. And nope. then she asks, do we have any thoughts on that? Yep, we've reverted back to old faulty leadership practices in a heartbeat. Um, many organizations who are trying to enforce their return to office are doing it through mandated card swipes, attendance taking, which is all breeding distrust. The other challenge we're seeing, um, and I actually talk about this in, in the book is one of the leadership practices is how we send signals. So think about for three years, employees have worked remotely, been productive, kept businesses running during the worst period in history and did it well. 
And now all of a sudden they're saying, oh, no, 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 you're not productive anymore. Come back to work, right? Fair, I'm sure has a, a good opinion on this and the research behind it, but is breeding tremendous distrust. So it was really good for three years. We did a great job. And then, oh, no, 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 not anymore. It's not, you're not doing a great job. They're reversing their, what they're said before and now mandating people to come back to a situation that's not necessarily beneficial to them. You know, one of the things I think we fail to consider is, and we can harken back to 9-11 as an example, when you have life altering events like we just experienced, people change. And 9-11 was one day and it changed our lives dramatically. COVID was three years. People have spent three years adapting how they work, where they work, when they work. It's given great agency to employees in that regard. And I think it's the biggest threat to leaders right now. They're afraid of that agency. I know fair is going to burst. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, I think I think this is <laughs> this is one of the most fascinating things is I feel like you had uh, two competing narratives throughout the course of the pandemic, and one was really targeted at people in leadership decisions, and it was all about this get back to normal thing, right? It's how do we get back yeah. to normal? How do we reopen schools? How do we reopen businesses? How do we get people back to the office? How do we get people back on mass transit? How do we, you know, how do we get people flying again? All of these things that are like, the only way we're going to survive as we understand our business models is get back to the status quo ante. And in the meantime, every thought piece being written for sort of normal people to read is the employee classes, everything has changed. And so you can't do both. Everything has changed right. means you can't go back to status quo ante. Can't you have go to back. go forward. Right. And I can't, think you can't go back. And we keep even using the term back to work. Like, no, mm -hmm. no. It, yes. Well, work it's is a different, different world. That's and I think when you different. look at measurement has a lot to do with this. I mean, it, oh, it, this has not spawned management into saying, and I was going to say, I have compassion because if you've been leading an organization or you've been a manager for any length of time going into COVID, you have to change the way you manage yeah. everything that you do. So I think we do need to put some empathy around organizations and particularly the middle management because they're the ones that don't know what to do. And we need to be able to equip them. And, and Fair, when we were talking, maybe maybe you can go over this a little bit when you do your culture studies on, you know, what's the real problem? Like, the, what is it that the managers aren't getting when they have to do hybrid and remote that they were getting when they were in person? Well, I think, I think there's kind of two parts of it. One is, and we talked about this the other day, just a sense of control, right? Like that yeah. I, I was used to how things worked before. I was comfortable with it. I felt like whether it was true or not, I had a better, you know, a, a, an easier time, a better time being able to assess the productivity of my workforce, assess the culture fit of people in my team, um, assess their progress, all of that stuff. That all felt easy to me in person. A lot of this is what I might just call nostalgia, right? Which means like, mm -hmm. you probably weren't doing that great of a job of any of those things oh. before, unless you're a very talented manager, and, and then maybe you were. Um, the thing that happened in the pandemic was this kind of suspension of disbelief about that. And like, I just have to trust you. There's no other choice. Now we're right. all kind of in the back to school season, right? It's a period of like, let's let's reboot and, re and start over again. And one of the things that I see with some of the companies we work with is very, in very well-intentioned managers who feel like, okay, we survived the pandemic. Now, how do we get back to a place of like really, you know, firing on all cylinders and being a really high performance organization? And they are just like cracking whips. And it's like, this is not the way to respond to a workforce that's frankly still working through trauma. I mean, this is a, we're living in a, in a poly yeah. crisis anyway, but like that specific crisis was really hard on people. They lost family members. They got ill themselves. Yes. Their whole lives were reshaped. You're going to have to continue the trust. And instead of just saying, well, trust is over. Now we're, now we're biometric measurement, you know, implementing biometric measurements and tracking everybody and all of that stuff. It just says, I don't trust you. Mm -hmm. Which we also, I have yeah. to just chime in because the, the Edelman Trust at Work survey says that deskless, I'm talking deskless workers now, their trust is at a 40% level mm -hmm. if they don't feel trusted. If they feel trusted, it reverts to 86% trust. And then that transfers into advocacy 
Mm-hmm. So they then, once they feel trusted. So if, if you're a middle manager or you're struggling with your middle, middle managers and you get them to start thinking about, do I trust the employee before they burn me or do I burn them before they trust me? You know what I mean? So mm-hmm. who trusts first? Because I think that's where the change has to come, right? If there isn't a mutual trust, somebody has to say, I'm, I'm going to trust you and, and I'm going to see what happens. Yeah. And the best leaders who were not just surviving through the pandemic, but actually thriving were the ones who had used empathy as their superpower. You know, this is the first time in history we were able to peer into people's living rooms. We were able to see people working, you know, converting their garages to an office so they could do their work and get things done. And we had a firsthand look at the challenges our employees were facing as they were trying to work their way through it. And so being supportive of that and moving to focusing on results over methods was a big shift and enabled us to let people be productive and thrive and get their work done and feel good about it and feel supported in order to do that. Mm-hmm. But let's let's just talk about how technology plays into that. I mean, prior to the pandemic, we had an office um, in, on the West Coast in the Valley. We had an office here in New Jersey at the company for 26 years. Um, the nature of the beast for us is we created our own technology to track, to by recruiters. So our recruiters created technology that they could use to track their own production. So they could say, I need to reach out to this many candidates to make sure I'm on target. That grew into a pretty sophisticated system that we have now. So we went into the pandemic. We were a step up in the fact that everybody was on a system that told us, you know, it, 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 it said, this is the project. This is how far they are in the project. This is where we're going. So we knew where we were on and off. And it really helps us because we're so client driven to make sure that if there were issues or obstacles, we could hit them before we got there. That technology, even through what was doing a good job for us beforehand, but I changed the whole demographic of the company through COVID because I became more participative in this, right? I looked at it as a tool for them, but then I started to say, we have, we need a different type of, of talent in our own organization who can operate this way. And I think the talent that, and we t- retained a lot of our talent too, but they felt more empowered as we really started to embrace technology to show us our productivity. So it wasn't, you're not being productive. We can tell because we're watching you. It's transparent to everybody. And I think that's given us a leg up. Yet I will say, you know, one of the reasons I'm so passionate about this is because I vacillate myself as a leader for 26 years. It's hard for me to say, to not see people. And I can't get anybody to come in the office. I go to the office right. by myself. Like we have much smaller offices. I, I go there by myself, but there's a level, our productivity is not dipped, but I know that because I have technology to support it. So where mm-hmm. do you guys see technology going? Anything, you know, the virtual realities are out there. I think what Upwork made that proclamation. I know that Meta is working on something just you know, interesting because they were like, no, never will we do remote working <laughs> to the point where they have lawsuits coming at them pre-pandemic. Then they're like, and and if you look at all the tech, it's like, we're in, we're out, we're in, we're out. Now we're back in hybrid, I I don't know. But these are the same organizations that are saying they're working on technologies that will make remote work better and easier. Yep. So what are you seeing from a technology perspective, Eric? Because I think you're the one that kind of spawned this when I was talking to you too. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, well, we we have been seeing it um, in a in a slightly adjacent space, which is in higher educate online higher education, and so this is already something that has been, you know, it's been around for decades. Remote, you know, remote education, but it's really blossomed with technology, and a lot of what's interesting now is this sort of tension between. Um, a feeling of like, I'm on my own, like, here's the curriculum, go learn it. And more of a sense of like, what is the experience like where I'm not sitting in a classroom amongst my peers with a professor in front of me with, um, you know, labs or discussion groups or whatever that I have to do as part of that course, where we go sit in some study carol area of the library, whatever it is we're doing, going going into um, a kind of traditional uh, four-year university on-campus experience 
how do you start to have a, an experience that does feel collegial, that does feel collaborative? Um, you know, all of those things start to become uh, an interesting challenge for the technology. And a lot of what, and here's my my camera not being able to find me now, <laughs> but anyway, speaking of technology, yes, <laughs> my, my camera gives up and just decides to focus on the background. Um, but I think the, the interesting thing about it is that the, you know, evolution of tools that are asynchronous, you know, if, think of something like Slack, like Slack doesn't have to be real time. I don't have to re respond to a Slack message right away. Um, that is searchable, that is collaborative, that's like all in one place. I'm not using 12 tools. I'm using one to communicate with my team um, that has some accountability plugins associated with it where I can say, yes, I completed this task or I'm having trouble with this one. Um, th th there are a variety of interesting kind of combinations of just practices, human practices, and then technology that enables those human practices to be asynchronous and remote um, that I think are, are really interesting in, in that space. And, and you see a lot of kind of evolution wow. towards that. Um, what would be interesting is to see instead of kind of I mean, this is one of the things that having run my own business now for 12 years, I feel like we frequently like trial some SaaS product that's going to make our efficiency and productivity so much better. And in the end, we just wind up building a spreadsheet. <laughs> you know, it's like, <laughs> it's fine. A spreadsheet is good enough. We can all that's access why we created it. our own. Yeah, exactly. That's why we created it because we have yeah. spreadsheets everywhere and notebooks. Right, everywhere. Like, that's all right. right. exactly. <laughs> is Excel going to save us? I mean, is yeah. technology going to be, like you said, we can't go back. Right. So is yeah. technology going to be what propels us forward? And Jess, do you have some questions? I do have some questions that have come in. So the first one is how much is the cost of contracted lease commercial real estate playing into the decisions to drive Huge. People to the office? Huge. Okay. Except yeah, I just read a report about um, New York City is only back to 50 percent of pre-pandemic levels of office occupancy. And if you follow Jamie Dimon, <laughs> one of his big pushes for having everybody back in the office, he's building some ridiculous like $5 million new office space in lower Manhattan that's supposed to be finished next year. Well, of course he wants everybody back. He's got to fill his building, right? Right. Um, no. It's a big cost. And it goes back to, you know, the question we often ask when we come into organizations to help them figure this stuff out. You know, what problem are we trying to solve? If it's a real estate issue, let's figure out how to repurpose that fixed cost for you in a way that you can recoup some of those dollars and then figure out the better strategy for your workplace. But two different things that we're trying to solve with one flawed strategy. Yeah. Well, I actually met with a construction company about this, right? Mm -hmm. So we're, and we were looking at, at some different spaces. I'm like, why don't you just, in, in New York, why don't you just change these into housing because there's a housing shortage oh yeah the cost to refit these these yeah. commercial it's, real estates are too high you actually have to take them down yeah you actually have to take the whole building down which the cost is even more now right so now we're right. back to oh just build another property so i think a lot of this over the next six months we're and, you know going into the half year next year really in 2024 we're going to see more about land yeah right. one of my like clients how much once we see commercial, this kind of, and I think commercial real estate is waiting to pull the trigger because they don't really know what this is going to look like for them. Yeah. And it is a best kept secret. When you've built these huge and, and invested in a lot of property, which there was a big bang in commercial real estate going everywhere, right? Because we were changing our office spaces to be more open. So everything was banging beforehand. Not only is it an incredible expense that we're looking at, but it's, it's this chicken and egg scenario where it, it's driving the thought process of other management of in, in, out, or both. And yep. at the same time, you know, how do you have an egg on your face that to your shareholders that this is how much this costs? It's huge. Yeah. And I don't think yeah. we felt the fallout for that. No. I don't think no. we well, see the fallout until next year. One of my clients just inked a $10 million deal on taking their entire corporate headquarters down to studs and rebuilding it right before the pandemic hit right so they were they're were on the hook 10 million bucks we're going to invest it we're going to rebuild it so they rebuild it they go through with it they end up with um four floors all together in the new structure and they're in the same kind of hybrid not everybody's coming back to the office so they got smart and they mo moved 
the first floor operations up to the second, third, and fourth floor. So their space is occupied two, three, and four. They sublet the first floor. Mm -hmm. So and it's and it's a flexible model now, right? So if there comes a time when they are going to have everybody back and they need that space back, they stop subletting. But in the meantime, they're bringing income in to to mitigate mm -hmm. that fixed cost that they're losing, and and it's a win win all the way around. Yeah, I well, think made a decision. Yeah, it's going to yeah. be very interesting next year, though, given the guidance from WeWork that a year from now they may not be a going concern. Uh, because they are a major commercial real estate leaseholder, especially in New York City. Yeah. And if they fold, that is default on all of those leases on oh, commercial yeah. real estate space. And yeah. um and any That's mortgages an they may hold. And that'll right. that'll that'll ding the sector real hard. <laughs> yeah. And I I think we're gonna see some government in, influence there. Mm -hmm. I mean, haven't we all learned mm -hmm. through the pandemic how much money government really has? You yeah. <laughs> Um, beyond all this BS that we hear and, and all the arguing and the budgets and things, yeah. we have a lot of money. So I think I think you are going to have to see some kind of lend out there coming up, which not yeah. new. But and I don't know about you know. I, is it a situation in your opinion, Marianne and and Farah, that which should drive it? Should the organization drive it, or should commercial real estate be driving this? And on that note, when you look at the trickle down, so yes. What about the guy who owns the deli? That's right. You still service shops. everybody. What about the, the, the facilities people? What about those whole neighborhoods that surround those those buildings? And I think that employees don't take that into consideration, right? They want what they want for them. But that's an economy issue that affects all of us. And I think that's that's part of what we need to look at. We need to hear our employees. We need to teach them how to tell us what's really important to them. What's going to make you stick with us? You know, how do we build your trust? And I think we as the employers have to be the ones that do that because an employee still, even though we see that balance and, and isn't that what we're talking about, right? The balance between the employer and the employee. And I know that, you know, the government and media is saying, you know, the unemployment rate is what's going to change that. I mean, I really do think the feds are like, let's get the unemployment rate up. We get the unemployment rate up, then we've got that good stat. I'm like, no, that doesn't work anymore. It wasn't mm -hmm. accurate before the pandemic. It's it, it's not really, it shouldn't be one of those indicators and, and you should yeah. focus on that. Let's get people unemployed so that we can balance out the economy. Mm, yeah. Do we really want to do that when we have a huge talent gap? I, you know, yeah. I don't know. So many factors. Yeah. yeah. I think more questions. Every, yeah. yeah. In yeah. every period of, oh, go ahead, Jess. So our next question is from one of our viewers. The more we talk about this topic, the more I realize how complex the issue is. It's truly layered from real estate tax implications for businesses down to an individual employee's needs. As consultants and advisors, how do we effectively highlight the complexity of this issue when discussing with leaders to first help them truly understand, then problem before solving it? Each organization will need a different solution. Absolutely. So how the, gift in, the gift in the garbage, in my opinion, is that we're going to be better organizations with employees that are more committed, that we're bringing this relationship closer together. Now, it's nice to say that, and it's all kumbaya, but we really have to help our managers. We have to know what's good for the employee population and specifically your employee population. Yeah, when, when there's what I call a copycat, oh, they're doing that, I'm going to do that. You know, I know a, a company that was, uh, it's a a cybersecurity company and they came out with some really cool products, but they were owned by like all these military people work there. And in order to feel on the up and up to millennials at the time, they put in a big green camouflaged sliding board. Never seen anybody use it. Like no. they were trying to be Google, like you need to know who you are. And I think yeah. as a leader myself, that's all I've got to go back on sometimes, right? Like, what is the compass for the company? And not everybody's going to fit our compass. You know, if, yeah. if you like a carrot and stick environment, if you have to be in an environment where you have to be pushed to perform, you're not going to do well with people science because we're like, no, we don't want to do that for you. That's right. On the other hand, there's people who can only work when they're in kind of a boiler environment, right? And new people, you know, new people coming into the workforce, how do we how do we train them? Oh, I'm not even going to go down that road yet, but that that's another another big topic, but I'm going to turn this over to you guys right now, but 
I think you, you've got to know who you are. And then I highly recommend chain, training mid-management, middle management to operate differently. So if you're going to be in a hybrid situation and there isn't a comfort level there, you've got to teach them how to do it. That's right. Yeah, I mean, very much, Christine, that's what we do in my organization is we come in, help leaders figure out. And the question we like to ask is, how do you define your winning organization, right? You have to start with what makes you successful for both your workforce, for your client base, that what is that North Star for them? And then you build from there. You know, everybody wants to be part of a winning organization. So you can become a real talent magnet when you create cultures, environments, work presses, have the technology, everything that is in service of that goal. And that's when you can um, really bring in the talent that you need and get the job done. Um, but beyond that, you know, the middle manager piece that you're describing is how do we help leaders be future ready and forward thinking? That's the goal, right? Because let's face it. This pandemic was, you know, life altering, transformative, painful. People are still, like Farrah mentioned, people are still working through the trauma of it all and trying to figure out how to get, you know, their lives back on track and so forth. But it won't be the last. Look what we're dealing now with hybrid, right? We're back in the same position. Nobody knows the answer. Mm -hmm. So we have to learn how to roll with the punches and be more resilient and develop future ready leader practices that will guide us to that place. Yeah. What, get ready for whatever the world's going to throw you next. That's and Vera, how about being blown around by every wind? You know, <laughs> next month, yeah. we're going to adjust have, your sales, right? We have to adjust have, your uh, sales. Yeah. And we, we have a TikToker um, who kind of really got a rough road when, it was, when she was featured on Fox. Gabrielle's mm. her name. She's going to be on next month. And, and she's part of the lazy girl movement. Right. And when you dissect that, it's not as bad as you think it is. It's like mm -hmm. it, it's more along the lines of working in a kinder, friendlier, more people oriented environment. Yeah. Some people. But I think for leaders, they hear this. You know, I was talking to to a pretty mm -hmm. well-known leader who just started like his 10th organization. And the first thing he said to me is, are you woke? I'm like, oh, no, I'm not woke. He's like, if you're woke, I don't <laughs> want to talk to you. And I was his head of HR even prepped me. Why don't you talk to him? But he's going to ask you if you're woke. Just say you're not woke. I'm like, I'm not woke. Okay. I, but he really, like, it wasn't even hello. It was like, are you woke? And if I was woke, he didn't want to talk to me. And after we, after we, you know, started sounding this out, he wasn't really afraid of change. He just right away was defensive because some of these things, there's so many things coming after you saying, you've been a bad employer. I've got to tell you, I, I've been around the block a while. If I was the same kind of leader I am today, 15 years ago, I don't think I'd have this company because I am a woman. No one would respect me if I was kinder and friendlier than all the men that were starting companies. Right? Okay. <laughs> truth out? Yeah. Every time a woman talks, you hear your mom. It's just the way it is. I still think that's the case. Subliminally, my mom is telling me what to do. So if it's not hard and heavy like my dad, I'm not going to do it. So becoming who you innately are as a leader, which I feel like I'm able to do now, right? Like I feel I personally as a leader feel a lot more freedom. But I think you have to look at what kind of leader are you really? And generally, you know, we, we talk about being our authentic selves, but it's not okay for the company to be their authentic self. I would go so far to say it is. In my world, as long as you're ethical and you're not doing something illegal, there's somebody who wants to work for you that won't yeah. do well in other environments. Yeah. The other thing I would just um, say back to the last question Jess asked us is I think Farah brings a very important addition to that conversation, and that is making fact-based decisions in, grounded in data. Mm -hmm. <laughs> There's so much propaganda and sensationalism out there in the media that it's hard for leaders to believe or understand what is really happening. And I think... Mm -hmm. You know, companies like Farah's and others that can help people adopt that decision driven by data and mm -hmm. facts and unpacking what's real and what's not is a critical element of moving forward in a positive direction. You're not believing the hype. You're not just taking it at face value because you read it in some, you know, white paper on the Internet. Right. Right. 
Well, and, and I think we also get wrapped around the axle of changing terminology. And I think social media makes this harder and harder to do because the terminology is changing all the time. We just worked on a, on a project with a company where we were talking to employees. We heard a lot about a desire for safety at work. And, you know, I'll be slightly cliche about it and say anybody who's kind of over like 45, 46, if I said to them, look, some of your employers are talking about not feeling psychologically safe at work. I got mm -hmm. an eye roll. I got a massive <laughs> eye roll, which was just like, you know, there, there's now it. all of these TikTok memes about Gen X kids basically being feral because I guess we drank out of, um, you know, garden hoses and that made us feral. I don't know, whatever. But like the, this kind of idea of like, we, we weren't ever protected. Why should you be protected and blah, 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 blah. When you dig underneath, what are people talking about when they mean safety? They mean things like not living in fear that every day you might be arbitrarily fired by a boss who acts capriciously. <laughs> They're talking yeah. about being able to speak up in a meeting and not be shouted down or discounted. They're talking about being able to ask for help and receive it as opposed to being told, don't come to me with problems, just come to me with solutions or what, you know, whatever cliche of management is still floating around out there. So they're, they're not really talking about I don't know what whatever people hear when they hear safety, which is clearly something that that is off-putting for you know for a certain generation of managers. So some of it is like let's dispense with the jargon, let's uh -huh. unpack what people really mean when they say what they want. I think I was giving you the example the other day of we hear about flexibility all the time, both for students and, and employees, and a lot of what they mean is agency, influence, yeah. grace. They they just. They don't really mean like, I want to be able to do my job at whatever hour of the day I choose and from whatever location. They just want to have a say <laughs> in yeah. how they structure their day. And that's not really that onerous on the manager. But I think when we kind of have tradition butting up against meme culture, <laughs> we wind up having conversations that just don't actually connect with each other at all. And so if you can unpack what people are really talking about, dispense with the jargon and then figure out, you know, what is our actual objective? What problem are we genuinely trying to solve? And then what's the best yeah. way to solve it? Then I think you can start to figure out a path forward. But yeah. if you're not doing those things and we're just all like, are you woke? And and I won't the, talk to you. Yeah. Then I don't know. <laughs> the irony of the whole thing is and I was talking to the CEO and founder a few months ago of one of the health tech companies that we were first, one of the health sets, which what a business, right? I mean, mm -hmm. it's off the charts. Who doesn't have a therapist, right? Mm -hmm. So the irony is there's so many people crying out to be heard, mm -hmm. but they don't have the compassion to understand that those are who are not hearing them don't have the wherewithal to know them. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a widespread issue, right? Mm -hmm. It's kind of like, this is what I need. This is what I want. When it really kind of starts with, let me try to emphatically understand where you're coming from and build the trust, whoever's side of the fence we're on. And, mm -hmm. you know, Marion, I don't know if that's one of the offerings that you have. I know through the TA cycle, when it comes to to reaching out to candidates, we collect that data, right? So we collect yeah. a lot of decline reasons, um, especially in high volume situations, why you're not interested. And we look at glass door reviews. Yep. Sometimes I believe in them and whatever. But take, getting it right from the horse's mouth, this is what I heard, this is why I'm not interested. This is the kind of position I would be interested in. It's very, very discovering. And it's not just all the bad stuff. It, no. it, it, it's stuff like the time is not right for me now, but I want to work there where I am here now because of this. So there's a lot of really good data in there, but I think we keep doing kind of this. I'm right. So, you know, digging in. Yeah. That um, chasm has existed for a long time. And the greatest disappointment is we haven't gotten any better at it post COVID, even through all of the traumatic change we went well, through. We're to having try this conversation. To that better. I just think, you know, I was talking about this in our all hands meeting. I just think that, you know, a large organization, if you've got a hundred thousand employees, if you've got 10,000 employees and, and leadership says, we want to do this. And, and, and this is what I hear. Here's who, you know, we've done our work. We now understand who we are as an organization. This is the ones that have, right? And we understand where we want to go. So how do we make that trickle down? Well, you're moving a, a big ship in a different direction. It just doesn't happen overnight. But I think COVID is mm -hmm. this. I think the discussions we're having now, we would not have had five years ago, right? No, we, yeah. we have no choice. Change. This is like pushing us. Yeah. Well, I think part of what we're seeing, I call it the talent trifecta in the moment, right? So attrition is up, right? There's a great Entrepreneur Magazine article, which was a compilation of 
of a myriad of surveys with all the data, but the um, attrition numbers are up for companies that are mandating these RTO strategies, right? It's a coercive power play. Their, their involuntary uh, turnover numbers are up by 42%. Plus, like you mentioned, you know, unemployment is still at historical lows. And then we've got applications are down. So just like you're describing, um, applicants are opting out if they don't find jobs that fit their needs, right? Whether it's flexible work arrangements or whatever the other things. And 42% of candidates are rejecting roles that don't have flexible work arrangements. So, you know, we're looking to do this, but, you know, many companies who are enforcing these RTO policies are struggling to fill jobs. And then the third leg of the trifecta is engagement is in the tank. So for organizations that are keeping their people in, probably because they're afraid to go or don't know where they're going to go next, now we have hostages. We're back to the days when employees are there because they feel they have to be, not because they want to be, and not doing their best work. So, you know, the other meme I love, Farah, is quiet quitting. Okay, <laughs> well, that's an engagement score, right? That's been going on for decades. We used to mm -hmm. call it, they quit but stay, right? They're they're still <laughs> here to collect a paycheck, but they're not doing their best work. And what we've come to realize, I think, as a result of the pandemic is not everybody is interested in doing that type of work. Not everybody is that ambitious about moving up in their career. They don't want the responsibility. They don't want the longer hours. They, there's a whole bunch of, you know, ill effects of advancing your career that, that, older generations were like, you know, work till you die. Well, that's not how people think about it anymore. Um, and we're seeing a lot of those changes show up in the type of work people want to do, when they want to do their work, where they're going to do their work from. Look how many people moved during the pandemic. I can't tell you how many clients of mine had employees that they were forced to um, let go because they wouldn't move back to be in a mandated, here's the worst one. This one I think was just straight up dumb. But one of my clients um, works for a pretty large consulting firm. They were, they're market driven. Four of his best sales leaders were forced to change their markets because they weren't within a 50 mile physical driving distance of the headquarters. So four of his best salespeople, their only choice was move back, or move to a different region where you are, right? And nobody was moving and they didn't want to change their markets. So two of them decided to, now they have to go learn a whole new geography, pick up a whole new customer base. So it's going to impact them, right? It's sales. They, they're they going to have a lag on how they can get back up to speed to be a top performer again. And my client lost four of his best people. So his results for the year are going to be in the friggin' tank. Mm -hmm. all because somebody decided you have to be 50 physical miles from headquarters. What sense does that make? And I mean, I, I, I think when, when companies don't know what to do, yeah. their knee jerks are, let's say they throw the gauntlet down. That's what, what they're doing. Mm -hmm. when, <laughs> when you throw the gauntlet down, you have to be prepared for the outcome. Right. Well, right? And that's what's happening. And I now. think most leaders these days know not to throw the gauntlet down unless they have to. And I think when it comes to this topic, they're like, we're bleeding money. These, and fair, maybe you can talk a little bit too about the maybe not so accurate production numbers. Right. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think this is this is where um, that sort of coercion is is very funny because they wind up kind of post rationalizing, and so you get these yes. um, you get these pieces sometimes only a couple of days apart in something like the Wall Street Journal, where piece number one is all right. You know, the work from home experiment results are in, and it was a failure, and it's all it an evolution. Yeah, it's, it's all anecdotes. It's all managers saying, I don't really like it that much. And it's, you know, <laughs> it's what we sort of jokingly have been referring to as vibes based reporting. And, you know, it's it's not show me how it's affected your productivity. It's how are you feeling about it? And then they say they feel bad. And so then we write a story saying, well, if the managers feel bad, then it's a failure. Two days later, there's a piece that says yet another well-constructed, um, you know, social science 
paper has come out and work from home is showing that people are more productive when they have the option to work from home than when they're forced to work in the office. And so like, you know, the question then becomes, what the heck are we talking about when we talk about productivity? <laughs> and uh, the piece that that we just wrote about the, the reality of, of work from home, of remote work was based on a piece, a little small item in Barron's that basically said, Americans are 1% lazier based on the Bureau of Labor Statistics <laughs> time use survey, which is not what that survey says. <laughs> I don't know. I feel one percent lazier. I was uh, measuring my percentage of laziness the other day, and I called in to report it. Yeah, down twenty exactly. percent. Down twenty percent. Right. <laughs> Where did they come up with this crap? <laughs> Well, and especially when like what what the Bureau of Labor Statistics is trying to do is calculate a workforce productivity score that has to do with work hours against whatever the measurement of output is. So usually revenue, but sometimes units produced or that kind of thing. And like, that's what they're talking about. But when you introduce the word lazy, we're now talking about a totally different category of produ productive. We're talking about a kind of moral accounting about productivity. It's yeah. like, you know, are, are you a nose to the grindstone kind of person? Are you hyper committed? Would you never say that you're a, in a lazy girl job or a quiet quitting or whatever? And I think that it's it's fascinating to start to kind of unpack those things. It's also really interesting to then find out. So that, that piece came out in a few weeks later, the, the update to the, to the time you survey came out and basically found workforce productivity had reversed its five quarter decline and was now up. What was driving workforce productivity? Reduced workforce, reduced labor hours. It wasn't that people were working more hours and so therefore productivity went up because productivity from a workforce productivity economic indicator point of view is a ratio. It's not a right. direct measurement of the number of hours people work. It's a math function. <laughs> Exactly. Interest rates go up, fuel prices go up, uh, reduction in force happens. All of those things can affect the ratio, even if like revenue is flat. So like, you know, th these things are far more complicated than that. And that's what we kind of wanted to unpack is like when you're trying to say that people working from home are working fewer hours. And so therefore, that's the cause of di diminished workforce productivity. You know, that's just not right. <laughs> it's, it's just literally. Not where's, the where's the money? Where's where's the money go? Right. Mm -hmm. like, the epiphany for me right before I met you, Farrah, was I, I, I've been watching CNN was last week and they all, they were talking about um, workforce productivity. Mm -hmm. And then they switched over to this young guy who never seen his reporter. And he's like, I don't believe in working from home. And here's why I don't believe in working from home. I like better exposure. And, and I'm like, who is this guy? And didn't somebody just pay him to do this? Like it, it was almost <laughs> like somebody said we're you know advertising on your channel get somebody on there to talk about this because i feel i feel like the last three weeks in particular has been a big push of you're going back to work you're going back in the office right. and i think there's money fueling that it's the propaganda yeah. campaign because when you really challenge people remote work has become the scapegoat to drive other agendas and so I want to bring people back because remote work makes you not unproductive. Well, that's not really true. And there's a lot of, you know, stats and data to prove otherwise. But the reality is it comes back to the golden question we continue to ask, what problem are you trying to solve? And yes. that is clearly not it. Yeah. Well, there, there's a, a, a thing going around um, this morning on um, X, Twitter, or whatever the heck we're calling it now. Um, <laughs> And it's this guy, Tim Gurner, he's Australian. He is um, the progenitor of the uh, millennial trope about um, how they spend all their money on avocado toast and so therefore can't afford mortgages oh, on their homes. Um, so he's on a... Um, on a stage with the Financial Review talking about how uh, the problem is the workforce is too arrogant and we need to beat them into submission by driving unemployment up and then they will get back into the office and go to work. And this this, this is literally how this guy talks. I am not really putting words in his mouth. He literally called the oh. workforce too arrogant. Right. Now, right the thing now. to know about him is he's speaking of the Financial Review's property summit. He is a property developer. <laughs> like, why was he mad of at course. millennials for not buying enough property? Oh, gosh, right. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. like, That's it. They're driving a different agenda. Yes. But but the interesting impulse in all of this, and I think it's, it's true in both directions. We, again, we worked on a project recently yeah. where, you know, there's a senior manager who's incredibly well-intentioned. He means well. He's a verbal exter you know, external processor. Um, he, he is um, a kind of my talking will eventually turn into stuff kind of a guy. And 
it, it he is not actually trying to mansplain anybody but because he is a man and he is repeating what you just said as a way of processing what you just said he's getting labeled a mansplainer mm -hmm. and it's like well that's unfair too right like he's he's doing his best he just doesn't have a management style that you as the employee like very well so that like mutual empathy thing does need the operative to phase is you as an employee yes because there's plenty of employees that like that yes I know there are plenty to say it, it would never have bothered and, and me but i'm the same but <laughs> yeah. That's true. And I know we're coming up on the hour. Um, so I want to I want to thank you both so much for being here. I, I, I want to close in, in talking about um one of the things that, that I heard from a Gen Z, which is interesting because last week I had a, a, a millennial talking about millennials and they were really like missing the point of Gen Z is is even more empowered because of of millennials, right? But the thing that she said is Nothing that I'm saying is unique. It's been around for years. My grandparents felt this way. They just couldn't talk about it and they weren't mm -hmm. supposed to. And I thought that was an emphatic view on things. It, and it really caused me to stop and look back and say, when I entered the workforce, what did I expect? And where were my pain points? And try to go back and reflect on that, which has caused me to kind of put my arms around the woke you know, thought process. We have enabled, our society is, is maturing, it's growing, and I don't want to be left behind. So I need to understand, but we also have to keep that balance, right? Because we have been around longer. So we do have more experience. So taking that, you know, your unique self, your authentic self, and combining that with experience, and hopefully we can bring it all together. I want to thank you again for being on our next webinar, Reimagine. I'll invite you both to come back anytime, and certainly anytime for the comments. Um, is uh, they're always on Wednesdays, October 18th is the next one, We're always at noon Eastern, looking forward to seeing anyone. And Jess, we do have a copy circulating of the webinar for everybody who attended, right? Yes, everyone attending today will get an email with a link to this webinar and also a registration for next month. So we hope to see you. Awesome, right. keep reimagining. Thanks for having us. All right, talk Thank to you, you soon. Bye now. Bye.